I've never seen a diamond in the flesh. I got my teeth on wedding rings. In the movies. And I'm not proud of my dress. In a tournament No postcode envy. But every song's like gold teeth, gray goose tripping in the bathroom. But it's all that's left in the hotel room. I'm not caught up in your love affair And we'll never be royal It's a one in our blood That kind of luck's just ain't for us We crave a different kind of buzz Oh, oh, oh We're better than we ever dreamed And the Grammy goes to Royal! By Ella Yelich O'Connor, Lord! I think the only time I've seen her a little bit sort of shocked was when she won the first of her Grammys. Well, hello. This is the one thing that I did not expect the most about tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. You just see the realisation, which was, I belong here. I'm, I'm here with the world's biggest and most successful artists. Going back to the start of 2013 and this random little tune and then now she's on stage with Taylor Swift and she's winning Grammys, it's just really crazy. Seventeen and unstoppable, Lord. I don't think there's a time in your life when you're more intelligent or more interesting. It's probably quite true. I've never seen the diamonds in the flesh. I cut my teeth on wedding rings in the movies. And I'm not proud of my address. In the torn up town, no postcode But every song's like gold teeth, gray goose tripping in the bathroom, blood stains, ball gowns, trash in the hotel room. We don't care. We're driving Cadillacs in our dreams. But everybody's like crystal, made back diamonds on your timepiece, jet planes, islands, tigers on a gold leash. We don't care. We aren't caught up in your love affair, and we'll never be royal. royal. Um, they wanted to give me the tools to be well-rounded. They signed me up for drama classes when I was like six, and that that was a big thing for me because I have always been kind of this. I've been a bookworm and like super introverted, and like even now the thought of like ordering something from a waiter who I've never spoken to is like slightly distressing for me because I hate just random interaction, which I've gotten way better at. When we first heard Royals, one of our DJs just found a random link on SoundCloud on the internet. We didn't get it through the record company at all. It was all very organic. One of his mates had shared it on Facebook or something, and um, he just brought it to a music meeting one day. We had a listen. We're like, it instantly hits you, that song. And um, that morning when we played it on air and I was in the studio for the first time and I saw the text machine, people texting in their reactions, instantly it connected with people straight away. No one really knew who she was. Um, Universal weren't forthcoming and giving us the music. They had a plan behind the scenes. And then the mystery about Ella was bubbling away in the background. Who is she? What does she look like? From the get-go, we put the shows on sale and the... Auckland show sold out in 37 seconds. It was a cheap ticket, but you know, when there's a vibe, there's a vibe. If something's hot, it's hot. And that was before she'd broken globally. So it was just a local 
there was a vibe on here locally. A lot of people didn't even know what she looked like before she got on stage. So there was this mystery as to who the girl was. I think that was the, the start of, uh, of the secret to her success, was just the, the mystery and the way she was able to coordinate social media and, and, and the media in, in general in terms of building mystery and expectation about who she was. Obviously to most people in the world, Lord just appeared fully formed, this 16 or 17 year old star who was suddenly on the top of the charts all over the world. But there was a long path to that. Actually, she was discovered at the age of 12. The father of one of her school collaborators, the, the boy she played music with as a duo, had filmed her and his video got taken to the record company. She was in a band with my youngest son, Connor, uh, probably in 2008. And um, they, they did quite well, I think, at school. They won lunchtime competition. Um, the way the Ella and Louis thing came about was um, Louis asked Ella if she wanted to play in another band, which was outside of school. And so she didn't hesitate. And that brought her, I guess, into our lives. Every Monday night, I think we had a thing called Music Mondays. They'd, they'd all turn up here after school. And it was just the loveliest time in our lives because um, our kids were doing something that they really enjoyed, which was music. They were doing it, um, you know, with some great friends. And then suddenly this, this girl walks into, into their band and, you know, we used to sit up here in the house and we used to go, man, is she singing that? Uh, you know, and, and, or is the band playing that? And they were just fantastic. And... We always sort of pinched ourselves and thought how lucky we were to hear all that. And I mean, when they, when they started playing and learning together, uh, they were really keen to perform live. And I used to send out, um, you know, some sample uh, recordings that I'd made in the basement. What would my mama do? 
Ella Yelich O'Connor is with us and Lou McDonald is accompanying her on guitar. Hello. Hello. Right. Now, people have been telling us how good you are and then they sent us a tape of you guys. Oh, yes. And we thought, wow, she's got an amazing voice. But you were only about 11 then, weren't you? Yes. Uh, mm. 10 and a half, 11, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So you've known Ella for about a year. So how long has the, have the sessions been regular? About six or eight months. Yeah. Um, she did um, sing I, um, competition. Sing competition. So she asked me to play a song... Warwick Avenue by Duffy, and we played that, and she won. won it. So yeah, so we just, we just started on. learning more songs from there. Going from there, having some fun with it. Get so many bands ringing or emailing, and I can't book them unless I hear them because I just need to see how I think they'll go here. And um, yeah, he sent three tracks and about four photos, and all the photos were. Um, Ella and Lois, and um, yeah, there's, I think the reason I booked them was because they looked really sweet, and because she had pretty good voice, and she did a few covers, and one I liked the best was Duffy, it was a Warwick Avenue cover, and yeah, it just kind of went from there. Puts different tones on everything, and I thought you'd be quite interesting live. You wouldn't necessarily think she was a Kaylee singing, I don't think. Yeah. But I thought, I wonder if it's just me imagining that she's good or whether she actually is as good as I think she is. And so I thought, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to send, uh, you know, a squeeze down MP3 of her singing to uh, to Scott McLaughlin at Universal Music and see what happens. And uh, yeah, he came back with a lovely email. He came back and said uh, it was just a one-liner saying, "I think she's intriguing. Can you bring her in?" talent was pretty raw and I'm not sure the record company really knew what to do with it but what they tend to do with, with talent that they're nurturing is try and match them with, with people that are going to help bring that talent out. Eventually they put it together with Joel Little who was a classic producer but they did head it off. There was a spark, a musical spark. So yeah, that, I, I guess that was the, the next phase in her, in her career. Um, was just, you know, her writing music and, and running the show, which is which is great. It's Joel's talent and Ella's talent, the synergy and the chemistry between the two of them, producer-artist relationship, which has created something at the right time that a global audience is wanting. When I started to write the album, um, I was 16 and, you know, things had definitely started to happen in my career, so I kind of I had more of an understanding of what I thought I wanted to do. But, like, to be honest, my perception of me as an artist and my, like, the goals that I have for myself just changes all the time. Wait till you're announced We've not yet lost all our graces The hounds will stay in chains 
Look upon your greatness and she'll send the call out, 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 send the call out. The team came about, uh, we'd been writing the album in the studio for about two months and um, I was in this really weird headspace. I thought what the album needed was the second Royals. I was basically trying to rip off Royals, which is kind of crazy because you know, you're never gonna get anything good happening if you're trying to copy something. Um, and, and I was writing all this really weird, bad music. Um, and my producer was like, look, we should just have a few days off. And I had a few days off and, uh, and I came back and we wrote team basically in like a day. And he'd come up with the melody for that opening part. And I was like, that's kind of cool. It's in a weird, irregular timing. And it was just a cool vibe. And, and then we were like, what if we took that last line and repeated it? And for me, that part was almost like shifting into the teenage world. Like, you know, you feel like you're like going through a doorway or something, you know, and then you're like, okay, now we're in. She describes the difficulties of fitting in and things. She sings for the weirder kids, the kids that don't exactly fit into the whole popular group. They're, they're raw, they're passionate, they're original. Uh, they're so relatable to, um, to New Zealand and to us, I suppose. <laughs> I, don't, I think you'd have to be quite headstrong, like, you know, know what you want and not be easily wavered by what other people think and what the media say about you. And I like that they're unique and different, and it's like you have to actually think about what she's saying instead of just being like, oh, it's obvious. You know, you can tell that she wants people to understand that she's trying to give out a message. That song to me, it's actually like one of my favourites off the album. Um, but it's cool to me because the whole thing, you know, Royals had been blowing up at that time. It was, everything was kind of going crazy. And um, I had this really amazing connection and still do with like the teenagers that listen to my music, people my age who connect with it. And what I was trying to say in that song is no matter how crazy this whole thing gets, I'm doing this for you and I'm gonna try and use the voice that I have to represent us as best as I can. I'm excited to grow up. No, I'm, I'm not. Quite ready. <laughs> I mean like I'm excited to like get to like twenties and like and be stop, in that. Stop. And then just drop because I don't want any more responsibilities Children? than you have to do after that. Children and having to pay <laughs> bills and tax and just everything. <laughs> it's like the debate between not wanting to leave high school because I don't know what to do after high school and the one wanting, I've, and then wanting, wanting, to to leave, wanting to leave high school and do life, but 
but what? <laughs> yeah, it's just a big learning curve being a teenager, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> Experiencing everything for the first time, I guess. Yeah, first time for lots of things. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> I wrote this song a couple of years ago, and I wrote it after my friend and I threw this ginormous house party at my house. And it was the first time I had done something like that. Anyway, my best friend and I crashed in my bed after kicking out everyone who needed to be kicked out. And I turned to him and I was like, there's something kind of crazy about throwing a party like this and doing something this huge. It feels grown up and it feels like a rite of passage. And that's cool. It's cool to do stuff for the first time. But it also really freaks me out because once you do something that feels grown up, it's really hard to come back. And if you've only ever been a kid, the thought of having to be an adult is really Terrifying. <laughs> the drink you spilled all over me. pretty much. It's a cool place to live, but like, it's funny how small places can feel like your whole world. You know, they can feel so huge and you know every little part of them. Um, and it's beautiful, it's like, it's really safe, it's, um, and so I had such a strong, like, identification with where I lived and it felt like my whole world, you know, until I left it. It brings you super close to people. So the people that I went to high school with, the people that, that I grew up with. I, I was in her primary school classes, um, in some of her high school classes and her design classes and stuff. I used to be good, I was good as friends with her and I still talk to her occasionally. But you know, she was pretty chill, pretty humble, quite a humble girl. But like knew she was gonna famous, you know, she had this like strut, she'd walk with this like strut round school. Everyone at high school knew who she was at the time. Mm -hmm. She was like up and coming, but no one ever thought she'd really get that big. I think everyone no. sort of knew when she surprise. got, she, she sort of just climbed the charts and everyone was really impressed and mm -hmm. everyone was like, oh, we know her, it's just Ella from school. Yeah. I never even really thought about the rest of the world until I left New Zealand. And it's been a weird transition coming from a really small suburb um, and writing about that world, you know, and the people who populate that world. Going from that to being in a new country every day, meeting 15 new people every day, just being overwhelmed by the 
a sense of how big everything is and realised how much stuff there is. I mean, it sounds stupid, but there's a lot of stuff out there that I didn't realise until pretty recently. Um, and like for a long time I wrote very specifically about my suburb and being a young person just feeling like no one cares about you and your experience isn't even meaningful because who's going to make a movie about your suburb, you know? <laughs> I guess being like a youngster in Devo is like kind of like you grow up in a certain like lifestyle way so it just it's like what everyone does you do it too I guess. Devonport is it's so safe down here you don't need to worry about anything you know. Like, it's just boring. Like there is a little bit going on here but not that much. You want to you got to jump across the ditch and go to Australia if you want something more. Growing up like I mean, everyone's got to grow up, don't they? I mean, no one chooses to stay young. I mean, would you want to, though? Like, No, I don't think so. No. I think it's every... an awkward part of it. I think life. most of the young people here will move away from Devonport as they get older. Like, there's not too much to do. There's the movies, and like most people go up to Takapuna, which is down the road. I think being bored is such a quintessential teenage emotion and a lot of people when they were like reviewing the album they were like oh she just talks about boredom all the time but it's true you know teenagers can't wait to get out of their suburb and you know or where if they live and start their lives and that was a big feeling for me when I was like even when I was getting the the bus and the boat and the train every day to to the studio I was like I just want to be somewhere that's exciting and that's beautiful to look at and I want my life to start um, but my life has started. It's been a disadvantage to be, for New Zealand to be where it is, proximity to the rest of the world, but the internet has changed that. Living in a global society, um, whilst the rest of the world thinks New Zealand is a long way away, <laughs> we're not. You know, uh, we're right there on the internet. For us, a 24-hour flight to London is nothing. Um, the American music and culture has an influence and it's very accessible here for us, as to as music from Europe and the UK. So New Zealanders are quite, quite adept to pulling in different influences and listening and watching and, and, um, and creating their own sound. She's grown up in a world of social media uh, where you can have your own Tumblr account and your Facebook and your Twitter and 
do a lot of that grassroots fan base building yourself. I think the the generation she's talking about, they do sit online and they are on Facebook and they are on Twitter and they are watching people's posts and their updates. And for that reason, it's a really good way for bands and artists to be discovered. the internet so I have a degree of fluency you know it feels like another language that I know whereas it must be really difficult being an adult and having to you know I, I guess a lot of adults are super early adopters of it but they're still adopters this is literally something that I was born into so I understand like how music's consumed and how it's like how it's accessed these days and I know that it's different to how it was when you read Lord's tweets and Instagram and everything, you can just tell she's writing it, that's her. And so that direct line in from artist to fan is something that's never been able to happen before. Previously, you'd have to do your interview with Rolling Stone, they'd pull out all your quotes, use what they wanted, skew it all around. Now, through social media, artists like Lord can just speak directly to their fans, so I think that's like an amazing thing. It was Ella's plan to put out some of the first singles for free. And, you know, she built that social media um, platform. So I think it's been great for the wider industry to watch that collaboration and, and see it see, see a different journey um, to success rather than what we can what we, we would consider the stock standard way to get a to get an artist broken. We've sat around this table, the, f the first big show we booked for her, and we sat around this table with a whole lot of production guys and, you know, gurus in New Zealand, and they had all these ideas, and she told them she didn't like their ideas, and told them what she wanted, and there's just, there's no need for us to, we haven't had to advise her as such. It's totally based on her aesthetic, on, on what she likes and doesn't like, and there is no way that, you know, the record company telling her, sing this song, um, it'll be a hit, was going to satisfy her. It had to be something that she felt herself. She's very clever at what she says yes to, um, would be my impression. Uh, for example, picking up the soundtrack for Hunger Games, I think is genius. Absolute genius. I can't think of another artist in recent times at that age, at that stage in their career, who's been given the trust in, in such an amazing project. I'm a princess cut from marble Smoother than a storm And the scars that mark my body They're silver and gold My blood is a flood these precious stones, it keeps my veins hot. The fires found a home in me. I move through town, I'm quiet like a fire. And my necklace is a rope. I tie it and untie. And the people talk to me. Lord 
its influences and what makes up her music because while it is quite an original persona she projects it's also quite familiar in some ways musically um, she's obviously listened to a lot of hip-hop even though she's not a rapper but there's an embrace I suppose of electronica that comes more from the hip-hop world than from the pop world but she's a great sponge you know she'll take from wherever something interests her I realized when um, I'm so inspired by the internet my influences which are so vast and it's just not that kind of music consumption just isn't like wouldn't have happened in the 80s you know it's like we all consume so much and then like take tiny parts from everything and I started listening to electronic music I think I was like 13 when I properly started listening to it and that was a time when I just lived on SoundCloud and I would just kind of hop from SoundCloud to SoundCloud and just like find random things and a lot of stuff that I love I don't even know who it's by and I don't know the name of it my music being put into a weird context like a remix you know and like that doing really well that's super exciting to me. you guys know this one I love working with with Flume because he started so young and he's so talented and he sees the world you know in a similar way that I see the world There's a rhythm in her music and production that is quite unique as well. It, it crosses the boundaries in, in genres. It has elements of dance, you know, hip hop, pop, um, which makes it a very interesting, interesting listen. So every time I hear a Lord song, you know you're going to hear something quite different, but there's a thread of familiarity that runs through it. And again, it's different to anything else you're listening to anywhere. She's got uh, lyrical messages that uh, are just resonating with that age group. And um, like I said earlier, it's not like the superficial kind of obvious teenage stuff that she's singing about. It's actual poetic, beautiful, uh, original, and most importantly, real messages that relate to the teenagers of today. Um, so yeah, there's no surprise that Time Magazine named her most influential because she's in a lot of ears right now. I like Laws music because it's different to most other singers that are in the top charts these days. And also in the way she dresses and the way she looks. Like she doesn't have to wear slutty or like short costumes to be seen as pretty or anything like she wears good clothes yeah she wears what she wants and she is beautiful yeah basically it's just not all about parties and drugs and boys and love like it's just, it's even though those messages are crossed like she puts them in a more way that we understand rather than talking about how it's all glam and it's not talking about she sees it from more the way that it actually is <laughs> I think the image that Lord presented, which really is quite different from the, the American female pop stars, the Katy Perry's, Taylor Swift's, Miley Cyrus, um, part of Lord's image is rejecting that very American, acquisitive, materialistic image. And I actually think 
teenagers saw that around the world and found it refreshing and went, hey, we don't have to be Miley Cyrus. Teenagers are just, are just cooler than everyone else. Like, we know what looks cool, we know what sounds cool, um, and usually we know it before adults do. Um, and so that's an audience that I really trust. And, you know, like being a teenager, um, I know how annoying it is to be misrepresented and to just feel like no one is making anything, like, for you, you know, no one's, like, catering for you. That's just one of the misconceptions about young people is that we want to listen to superficial music. I've been roving around, always looking down at all I see. The paint faces fill the places I can't reach. You know that I could use somebody. Yeah. You know that I could use somebody. Yeah. Someone like me, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's slightly unusual. You know, she's not a normal teenager in that whatever normal is these days. So she's slightly left of centre and, and alternative, and that absolutely plays to her advantage. I think that's a big part of her success, is that she was so clearly an alternative to that very, you know, the, the, the blonde, beautiful, um, idealised American female image that is presented by so many pop stars. It's not the typical pop music where it's about partying and, you know, drinking and driving my fast car. It's the exact opposite to that, which I guess appeals to the average person who's living life every day, going, oh, you know, I relate to this. I'm not a pop star. changed at all. She's still Ella. Hasn't gone to her head. She's a little Kiwi girl who's jet-setting around the world, but 
but she's doing a thing and her parents keep her in line. We have not seen the best of Ella or Lord yet. I think it's going to be amazing to see what um, life experience, collaboration and, uh, and time brings next. Perhaps it had to come from somewhere like New Zealand, you know, that America couldn't have invented Lord. Uh, that she's actually a combination of influences that really stem from this place. definitely mindful of you know this being my first record and it's important to me to have space to grow like I'm thinking three records ahead five records ahead and I don't want to get too big too fast I want people to grow as I grow